uh, grab your Bibles and turn them open to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and find verse 11 with me. Acts chapter 16 and verse 11. Um, a buddy of mine, he actually pastors a, a church down the, down the way over at Sligo Baptist. His name's Mark Brockman. And uh, he's, he's a good friend of mine. And he, years ago, I don't know how long ago, but he said he, he went to school. He told me a story one time that he went to school to uh, be a DJ on the radio, that that's what he originally wanted to do was to be a DJ on the, ra- a DJ on the radio. And he said he had this teacher that their final exam for the, for the class, it was all about kind of being in the sound room, in the sound booth. And uh, the, the, the whole deal was like, if you're on the radio and there's dead air, then people will turn off. You have like just mere seconds to get people to, to stay and then they'll, they'll be gone. And so you have to be very quick to react to get, pe- to get it back on air if something was to happen. So in this final exam for the class, the teacher would go into the sound booth and rearrange all of the cords. This was back in the day when they'd have to like unplug cords and plug them in to change the, uh, to change the, you know, songs or what was being played. And they would have to actually have a physical switchboard. And, and he said, this teacher, they called it, it was the hell test. And they would just go in and they would just switch everything and mess everything up. And then you had like a limited amount of time, like two minutes or three minutes to go in and figure out what they had messed up. And what, what this teacher had messed up, and then you got to get it all put back. And if you can't get it back in time, it was a pass-fail exam. That was, the, that was the way to pass that class. And so everybody's extremely nervous. He said it was his turn to go in, and he goes into the room, and there is just nothing. He said it, it's just blank. And he said his, his heart began to pound, and he starts looking at everything. He starts to get ready to unplug all these different things. He's looking, and he's going, well, I'm pretty certain that's right, and I know that that's right. And he's just going over the different parts, and all of a sudden it clicks with him. And he looked down, and there was a power block. And he just reached down and it was one switch. He just hit the switch on the power block and everything came back on and it was live and on air. He said he was the fastest one. It was like 18 or 19 seconds and he was, he was out of the room. He said his teacher just grinned at him as he walked out of the room. And, and he, he told me, he said, Justin, that was, that was a good reminder for me to check the basic things. Because you just never know. Like you, you better start with, with some basic things. You better check some basic things first. Today, we're going to see a really short story in the book of Acts. I'm not reading a big chunk, just a little bit, just four verses. And I think it's a good reminder for us that you really never know. Now, I hope you're hearing this part. You really never know what exactly God's doing behind the scenes. So let's look at this together. This is Acts chapter 16 and verse 11. Did I give you enough time to find that? Okay, now I gave you a prep warm-up warm amen. Let's use a big one now. I'm going to say, do you have Acts 16 and 11? Yes. There we go. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. And, from, and the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that, of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she, had, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father. Father, we want, we are here in this moment to worship you. Father, I pray that you would lead us into that. Father, we're so grateful for, for great music and we're so grateful for wonderful fellowship and classes. And Lord, you do such a wonderful and mighty thing every week, week after week through, through your people right here. Father, I pray that you do a mighty work right now in your, in your word, through your word. Father, would you convict us? Would you pour your spirit out upon us? Father, I pray right now, this is a big crowd today. 
Lord, I'm certain that there are those here who do not know you as their savior. They, they maybe they believe in you, but they don't know you. Would you reveal yourself to them? Would you draw men and women, boys and girls, to you today, Father? Would you work in a miraculous way in this place? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you make your word come alive to us? Father, here we hold your living word. The grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but your word will stand forever and we hold it in our laps. Father, I pray that today you will speak through your word. We pray for salvation. We pray for new life. We pray for deliverance to be had right here in this building. We pray for those people who are watching online. Father, we pray that you will be revealed. We pray that we will decrease and you will increase. Father, we pray that your name will be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, therefore sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Thamothrace and then, from the, and then the next day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of Macedonia, that part of Macedonia. Now, do you remember where we ended last week? Does anybody remember last week? I'll jog your memory. Paul and Barnabas had a fight. Do you remember that? Like Paul had an idea. The idea was great. Let's go back to those churches that we had planted. That's what Paul and Barnabas had done like five years earlier. Paul and Barnabas had planted churches all throughout what we would know as modern day Turkey. They had planted these churches. And as they planted churches, they, they planted them and they came back and checked on them. But they've been away for a while. And Antioch is their home city. They've been in Antioch. They went back to Jerusalem. They came back to Antioch. They've been teaching there for a while. And Paul had a great idea. Hey, let's go back to those churches and visit them. Remember, Barnabas wanted to take Mark. I know I'm kind of going fast, but did I lose you? Remember, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, but Paul said, I don't want to take Mark. And they had a huge fight. It wasn't supposed to turn out that way, but that's the way it turned out. They had a huge fight, and they just couldn't come to an agreement. So Barnabas takes Mark, and he goes one direction, and Paul takes Silas, and he goes a different direction. And then they ran into a second problem. Remember, they got into... Uh, they got into uh, 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 Ephesus, and they ran into Timothy. And they kept hearing about Timothy, Timothy, Timothy. And they, were, they, they, they loved this guy, this idea, this guy, Timothy. They wanted to bring him with him. But remember what was the problem with Timothy? He couldn't go into the synagogues. The Jews wouldn't hear him because he's half Jew and he's half Gentile and he's not been circumcised. So they're not going to listen to him. So Paul had just dealt with all that. Then he had to circumcise this, this guy because he needed to take him into the synagogues. And then they've got, now they've got three guys. There's Paul and Silas and, and then there's Timothy and now they're going to go out and they're going to check on these churches and plant more churches. They're going to go out and do the will of God. How wonderful of an idea. We're going to go plant new churches and spread the word of God. But remember, everywhere they would go, the Holy Spirit would hinder them. Do you remember that? They couldn't, see, they couldn't make it. It's like they would, they would try to spread the word of God, but the Spirit's hindering them and stopping them. And finally, Paul had a vision. Do you remember the vision? There was a guy from Macedonia. And this guy was saying, come over and help us. That's a vision. Paul is having a vision of a guy in Macedonia, a Macedonian man saying, come and help us. And so in verse 11, therefore sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course. They are being as obedient as they know how to be. God has given Paul a vision. There's a guy in Macedonia saying, help us. And Paul interprets that and says, I know exactly what that means. We should go spread the gospel. We should go share the gospel and help those people who are in Macedonia. So they come to Philippi. You should know this. There's a church that gets planted there. We see a book in the Bible called Philippians. They come to a place called Philippi. It's a city. And they come into the city. Now, what would you expect if you had had a vision of a man in, in Macedonia saying, come help us? And you got on a boat. This is not like today. This was not an easy trip. They got on a boat, they sailed, they went from one city to another city to a third city because they wanted to get to the foremost city of Macedonia. It's the city of Philippi. If you had done that, you had sailed on ships, you had traveled by foot, you were trying to get there, a straight course to get to this foremost city of Macedonia. What would you expect to happen when you get to Macedonia? Are you asleep or just scared? I don't know. You'd expect to see the dude, right? Like, if I was there, I would look for the dude. I'd be like, hey, where's the dude who was there? I'd be looking at Paul. You had the vision. If I was Silas, I'd say, you had the vision. What did he look like? Uh, did he have a beard? Was, it, was he in dark clothing, light clothing? Was he in a full robe and tunic? Like, what, what was he wearing? Like, get, give me something. 
And can you imagine as they're in the city, do you see what happens? They get to Philippi, they're in Macedonia. If it was me, I would totally be looking for a dude. And it says they were staying in that city for some days. Doesn't give us an amount of time, but I I would guess it would be my opinion that's probably less than a month, but definitely more than what I would expect. If I had had a vision, if you had had a vision and there's a, a guy in Macedonia saying, come and help us. And you ran there. You made a beeline to get there. Now you're probably wandering through the marketplaces, but he's not there. You'd love to go to the synagogue, but they don't have a synagogue there. Can you imagine the search that was on to find this guy? And can you, I think we think of it like you've made the trip, you're looking and they were there for some days. Can you imagine when it'd been like three days? I just wonder if Silas ever looked at Paul and was like, hey, are you, are you sure it was Macedonia? Like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of cities. You sure it, was, you sure it wasn't Galatia? Should, should we go back there? Can you imagine when it was four days, five days? I mean, they're away from their families. They've made a straight line to get to Macedonia. Can you imagine what it's been? Seven days, eight days, nine days, 10 days. You remember what you were doing 10 days ago? They've been there 10 days. They've been there 11 days, 12 days, and nothing. They were there for some amount of days looking for this guy, but he's not not been found yet. Will you hear this first thing I want to tell you this morning? I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to one of you, and you better hear this. It is not wrong to wait on God. We hear it. We know it. This is a back to basics thing. If we were to say it in Sunday school class, we're like, yeah, that's right. Wait on the Lord. But when it's been 10 days, 11 days, 12 days, when it's been 10 months, 11 months, 12 months, are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? You're not wrong to wait on God. As a matter of fact, God tells you to wait on him. He wants you to be patient and wait and trust in him and him alone. Almost 12 years ago, my wife and I and two other people planted Salt and Light Baptist Church. And everybody said, you gotta have a mission statement. You gotta have a vision statement. And where do you see the church in 12 months? And I'm telling you, this is a, this words came out of my mouth. I said, I think when we open, the day that we open, I think that we'll have about 50 people We're going to pass out flyers. We're going to put them in paper boxes and mailboxes. We're going to invite all the people that we know. We ran an ad in the paper. We were calling churches that we knew and talking to them about a new church plant that was coming in town. Any and everything we could do to promote the idea that we were going to have a new church plant. It was out in Crestwood at the time. And we were trying to get the word out that that, that there was a new church coming. We said we thought there'd probably be 50 people that would come. Do you know how many people were at our first service? Twelve. And my family made up seven. And then you would think, well, okay, but it probably, it probably came up a little. <laughs> you have, right. Before Sherry came, which was about the, I don't know, like third month. Third, third month, fourth month, there was one Sunday, we used to have a stage. It was in the corner. I'd, I'd rented the space with my brother. Now, we, we knew we were being obedient to what God was telling us. Like there was no question that there was an obedience there. We felt God calling us to plant a church. We planted a church. I'm telling you this. I knew nothing about planting a church. Nothing. I went and got a book from Lifeway Christian Bookstore that said the nuts and bolts of planting a church. That's all I had. You said, didn't you have any schooling? Sure, I had schooling. You think school taught me how to plant a church? You think school prepared me for some way y'all have handed me? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> You think, school plan, you think school could prepare you for that? No, I didn't know anything. I just knew I was being obedient to what God said. And then one day, there was a stage in the corner. We'd have to open up the curtains that we had like put up with, with PVC piping. And we would take the pews. We had these eight-foot-long pews, and we had six of them. We'd have to pull the six pews out. And so every week, we'd open the curtains, and one person on one side, one on the other, we'd carry the pews and come set them out. Well, on one particular Sunday, my wife and my kids were sick. Some of the other people were sick. So I got to church early and all by myself, I got on one side of the pew and I drug it over and I had to go to get the other side of the pew and I drug it over and it took me an hour to set out those six pews. And I set up the sound equipment and the guy that was gonna play guitar with me, he called in and I looked at my watch and it was 11.03. 
and there wasn't a soul in the building. And I remember sitting at the front door of this old warehouse building, looking up at the sky out of this glass front door, and I just remember saying, God, are you sure? Like, I'm trying to be obedient, but are you sure? By the way, just so you, I can finish that story, my brother-in-law showed up. He stopped by and picked up my oldest daughter and his girlfriend. Three people showed up for church that Sunday. He walked in the door and he goes, are we really doing this? <laughs> I was like, yeah, we're doing it. If two or more, right? I think we pulled out a table and we sat around the table that day, but, but still. He left that day and I remember thinking, Lord, I, like I feel like I'm being obedient, but I don't understand. Like there's nobody here. I can't, like how do I preach if there's nobody here? How, how does anybody get saved? If I, that's my brother-in-law and his girlfriend and my daughter. They're already saved and baptized. Like what, what do you want us to do? And I would love to tell you that that story ended with, well, we ended up with 50 people and then 100 people by the end of the year. And that's what I was telling people. I was projecting, that's what I thought. But you know what? One year went by and there was not 100 people. There was about 15 at the end of that year. And then there was about 18 the next year. And then there was about 20 the next year. We made our way all the way up to about 30 and then we had some people get mad over music and they left and we went down to about 18 again. And here's the end of that story. We, we planted Salt and Light in June the 5th, 2011. We did never break 100 people in church until Palm Sunday, 2021. 10 years. 10 years, and I'm telling you this. As a matter of fact, some of you are in this room right now said these words to me. Justin, how long do you go before you finally hang it up and just go apply at a church where there's already people there? Why do we need another church in Crestwood? And I would say to them, I don't know. I just know God called me. I don't have the answers to what he's doing. I just know he called me. And so I'm right here right now because this is where he told me to be. I hope you hear what I'm trying to tell you. I don't know how many days they were there. They were, in, they were in Philippi for some days and they waited. Why did they wait? Because God called them to be there. Here's what I'm telling you right now. If God's called you to do something, if you're inside of the will of God, it's not wrong to wait. Sometimes he just wants you to wait on him. Can we read that really famous passage? Would you pull it up on the screen for me there, Josh? Would you pull up, uh, look in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can look at the screen. But if you have one, look at Isaiah and look at chapter 40 and verse 31. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. I get so shaky up here, I can't hardly turn in my Bible, but I'm going to try to get there. Yeah, there we go. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Do you have that? But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, you're not wrong to wait on the Lord. Look what happens next in the story. Come back with me in Acts chapter 16. And now pick up with me in verse 13. So they've waited in the city for some days. And in verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside. Now pay attention. Where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, first of all, remember, the vision was what? Who's in the vision? A dude. It's a man. It was a man from Macedonia. They went down to the river. Okay, we've been in the city for some days. We've checked the markets. There's no synagogue. We've been looking around. We've not found the guy yet, but we've heard that there's some prayer happening. They weren't from Philippi. They didn't know what happened in Philippi. Somewhere along the way, they learned that they had a custom in Philippi to go down to the river. The people of Philippi would go down to the river and they would pray. Paul and Silas and Timothy hear about that. So down to the river they go. They want to go down to where prayer is happening. And when they get there, they find a group of women. Well, the dude's not there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> shot down again, right? I love this. Now, I'm skipping ahead just a little bit, but you did notice that that Paul and, and Silas and Timothy went down to the river where they're praying and they shared the gospel with those women that were at the river that day. That's what it says. They, that Lydia, we'll talk about her, her in a minute, that she heard what they had to say. I just want you to come back with me for a second to what's actually happening. They go down to the river where prayer is being made. Notice that they didn't necessarily go to, they're in Philippi, it's a Roman colony. You know, Roman, they were polytheistic. They didn't go to where there was false gods. I'm sure they probably did at some point, but that's not the story that God recorded. They went down to the river where everybody's already praying. 
And when they get to the river where everybody's already praying, it says of Lydia, it says of her, that she was a woman who worshiped God. I mean, do you see that? She worshiped God. That's in verse 14. There's a woman named Lydia. She sells purple. She's from Thyatira. She worshiped God. She's at the river worshiping God and praying. And here's what Paul did. Took her the gospel. You ready for this? You better hold on to your hats because it's going to get real. Just because something says Christian or something is religious or something seems spiritual does not mean it is the gospel. And just because you do something religious does not make you saved. You can pray and not be saved. You can come to church and not know Jesus. You can miss it because you're doing the religious thing. For some of you, you're gonna be, you're gonna be mad. I always make you mad when I say these things, but they're in my head and I'm gonna say them. You are not getting to God by lighting a candle. That's not how he told you to get to him. If he wanted you to get to him by lighting a candle, he would have put a verse in here that said, light a candle and I'll listen to you. But he didn't say that. He gave you a way to get to him, but it's not lighting candles. That's a religious practice we've taken. It's not by walking a certain path, a little labyrinth or something. That's not what he's asked of you. It's not by going on some journey where you take a whole weekend and you just get alone with him. That's not what he asked of you. God wanted one thing from you, He wants you to put your faith in his son, Jesus. And anything religious that gets in the way of that, you ought to check yourself. If you're saying to me, well, I feel like, here's what happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. I asked someone, I said, do you know Jesus as your savior? Do you know what they told me? True story. I've seen the chosen. Friends, just because it's got religion tacked onto it, just because it's got Christian tagged on it, just because you're listening to Christian music doesn't make you saved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. I hope you're, is everybody with me for a second? Have I lost you? Do you get this? Like they're at the river, they're praying, but Paul's going to bring in the gospel. Because even the ladies who worship God and they were praying, they needed the gospel. Because we all need the gospel. And if you lose that, if you lose the gospel, then you've missed it. You know what? I need to, just, I need to pause for a second. Are you in a rush? Good. All right, I need to pause for a second. Just in case you weren't here a few weeks ago. If you don't know, let me clarify the gospel for you because that's important. If I say gospel and you think that's four books of the Bible, you're, you're missing what we're talking about. If I say gospel and you think a type of music, you're missing what we're talking about. The gospel, according to the word of God, is that you, pay attention, you are a sinner. That you deserve to be separated from God for all eternity. But God didn't want that. So God sent his only son, Jesus, to come to this earth. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who created everything. Do you understand that Jesus created the world? He is the creator. He is the king. He is the Lord. He came to this earth and he died to pay your price of sin. Where you should be separated from God, Jesus died for you. That's why he was on the cross That's why they split his side open. That's why he was beaten and bruised to pay for your sin. He didn't fall asleep on the cross. He didn't go unconscious. He died on the cross. They took him off. By the way, you need to know this. They took him off the cross. They put him in a tomb. That's important because he's dead. He's all the way dead. And three days after his death, he got up out of the grave. Because death can't hold him The cross can't hold him. You ready for this? Your sin can't hold him. He beat every bit of it. He paid for your sin on the cross. He got up out of the grave. He rose from the dead. And he is the first fruits of that resurrection. And if he can raise himself from the dead, then he can raise you. Do you see that? That's the gospel. Now you ready? Anything that keeps you from the gospel because you're doing a religious practice, you've missed the point. Now I'm going to give you my example. I hope, that you, I, hope, I hope that you take this example. I hope you'll take this to heart what I'm telling you, but I also hope that you hear what I'm connecting it with. Don't let something religious keep you from, keep you from salvation. Just because something has religion tacked onto it doesn't make you saved, doesn't make it actually Christian. Okay, I went to a conference this past week. The conference was called End Abortion Now. You heard 
Kirk mentioned it earlier. I'm just going to plant that seed again. If you've got a note, if you've got a way to write it down, you need to write it down, you should go there. End abortion now. Three words. Endabortionnow.com. You ought to go or .org. I think they've got both. But um, endabortionnow.com or .org. You need to go there. I went to that conference because I am pro-life. I am 100% pro-life. When I say that I am pro-life, I need to clarify with you, I want abortion to be ended. I want no abortion at all, none, period. Are you with that? So I went thinking this is going to be a pro-life rally of some sort. There's going to be a pro-life conference. And they begin to tell us some things that are pretty shocking. And they start with this story. You'll see it. Those videos that Kirk was talking about, they're on endabortionnow.com. They're on the website. Go watch them. There's two videos in particular that I want you to watch. The one is the conference we went to. It's about three hours long. The second one is about a 17-minute video. And it's the story of what happened in Louisiana. And in Louisiana, here's what happened. End Abortion Now started with a church out in Tucson, Arizona. It's Apologia Church. You might see the guy on YouTube. It's Apologia Studios. He's got like a big long beard. He'll go outside of abortion clinics and he'll preach outside of abortion clinics and, and try to, he'll, he'll offer to adopt children right there outside of the abortion clinics. And he actually did that. There was a child with spina bifida and he, and he offered to take that child and adopted him. And by the way, they prayed for that baby before he was ever born. And even though the doctor said they should abort it because he was going to have spina bifida, guess what? Came out perfectly healthy. <laughs> by the way, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be that type of active. Anyways, Apology of Church came all the way here to Kentucky to tell us this, what was, what's been happening. And here's what they told us. They said, here's a story about Louisiana. Now, this has happened in 14 other states, but in Louisiana was the story they kind of focused on. In Louisiana, after all these other states, something kind of radical happened. They've been proposing a bill, and the bill that they're proposing is this. The bill says, now, for you lawyers in the house, don't come at me later, okay? Um, if you want to know, like, verbatim, go watch it, okay? Go watch it for yourself. But I'm trying to get as best as I can. The bill basically states that preborn life in the womb should be protected like born life outside of the womb. The same laws that protect you should protect a preborn, unborn child still in the womb from the time of fertilization. That was their big catchword. From the time of fertilization forward, that you should that, that life and a mother should be protected just like a life outside of the womb. Are we all understanding the bill that they're proposing? That's the bill. Protect life the same inside the womb as outside of the womb. Well, in 13 states, it gets shot down, it gets shot down, it gets shot down. Louisiana, something amazing happened. In Louisiana, they had seven of nine legislators agreed to put that bill through. They were for it. There's this guy... Uh, his pastor, uh, I can't remember his first name, his last name's Gunter, and he had been lobbying and, and promoting this bill. He's in a Baptist church in Louisiana, and he's the pastor, and he's been lobbying for a long time to try to get this bill. He finally gets it to wherever the house or wherever it's supposed to go. He finally gets it there, and the legislators are ready to put it through. Seven of nine have agreed that they're going to put the bill through. And they received a letter. They received, the, the legislators received an open letter. The open letter said, do not put that bill through. Now, I'm going to skip a little. I'm going to tell you the end of the story. Do you want to know why they said don't put the bill through? Because it would criminalize a woman. It's weird. I mean, you heard what the bill is. It's protect unborn life like you'd protect you know, life inside the womb, like you'd protect life outside the womb. We can be reasonable and say that doesn't, that doesn't sound like it's going to vilify a woman or criminalize a woman. Would you agree with that? That's not what that bill's doing. And I would say that's not shocking to me to hear someone come up with a, a radical claim to just try to, to sensationalize the situation and get everybody for that, uh, that particular call to say, hey, don't, don't vote for that bill. It's just their way of getting out of it. You're going to criminalize women. That's not really shocking to me because if I was to say that, you probably have an idea in your mind. You would think that that's, the, you would think that's probably the, the uh, Planned Parenthood you would think that that's probably one of those, one of those uh, pro-abortion movements or one of those pro-abortion websites. Here's the shocking thing. You all paying attention? To, do I have your attention? Do you know who sent the bill? Who sent the open letter to the legislators to say, don't put the bill through? The ERLC. That's the Ethics and Religious Liberties Committee. You ready for this? It's an arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. An arm of the Southern Baptist Convention sent a letter in Louisiana and said, don't put that bill through. Y'all want to know why I keep getting on the Southern Baptist so bad? Quit doing dumb things. 
Goodness gracious, why in the world would anybody who is pro-life say don't put a bill through that would stop abortion? Are you ready for this? I'm connecting it. Now, by the way, I've told you, I want you to go to that website. We're gonna jump in this fight. But you better hear this. Just because it's got religion connected to it doesn't make you saved. Now, I'm listen, we're a Baptist church. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Just because it's got faith connected to it or religion connected to it or prayer connected to it or something spiritual connected to it doesn't make it right. God has told you how to get right with him and it is through his son Jesus. The ladies in Philippi are praying by the river and what did God do? Sent Paul to them and said, come on, there's a way to get to God and it's through his son Jesus. All right, I got you all real quiet. Let's get back up. Let's not, let's not fall asleep on me. Look what happens. I know, it's, it's just, it was a heavy topic and now you're, you're probably thinking like I am, like what in the world is going on? Hey, I've said this before and I'll say it again. You better hear this. I'll be the one to lead the charge. I will take us right out of the Southern Baptist Convention. I couldn't care less. I'm not connected to those people. I have no ties to those people. If you, if you hear this, you want to stand for abortion, we won't be a part of that. Y'all better get real with that. We will not be a part. And if you are so connected with the KBC or the SBC that you can't take that, then you're in the wrong place because I'm with Jesus, not with the KBC. All right, now, forgive me. Certain, there's a certain woman, verse 14. I'm back in Acts. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. What'd she hear? She heard him telling the gospel. Do, do you want to see that? Just in case you're, you're missing that, do you just look back with me at verse 10? Now, this is verse 10. This was last week. After they had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, look what happens with this woman named Lydia. It's in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard, uh, heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. I don't know if, if that resonated with you the way that it should, so I want to be clear with you. This woman is wealthy. She's prominent. You say, how do you see that she's prominent? Well, number one, she sells luxurious things. Purple was a luxury. Purple fabrics, purple dyes, it was a luxury. This was a time when, when colored dyes and colored fabrics were not the big, it wasn't the biggest thing to try to make them colored like that. That was a luxury. That's why you saw in the tabernacle that God created in the Old Testament how, how opulent it was on the inside because God was creating something that was beautiful. It was a luxury. This woman is a seller of purple fabrics. I can relate with that. She sells purple dyes. It's a luxury commodity that she sells. Not only is it that, but pay attention that it's a woman. That's a, this is a world, like you live in America, as, as much as everybody would like to tell you that women are being oppressed, you're not. Don't be too mad at me for that, but you're not being oppressed. It's just not true. We're not oppressing you. But in this world, in the world that, that Lydia was in, no, it wasn't true. There definitely was an oppression there. It was hard for a woman to, to make it on her own. And so for Lydia, a woman to be a seller of purple and pants, where's she from? It says, and she's from Philippi. Is that what it says? No, it says she's from Thyatira. This woman was so good at her job, she was doing so well that she'd been relocated from Thyatira to come all the way to Philippi, a Roman colony. This woman is a wealthy, prominent woman. I would say to be in that world and to do what she's doing, she had to be very confident. She was a confident woman. She was a powerful woman. She was a wealthy woman. Later on, it says that she's the one who leads her whole house to be baptized. She's a leader of a woman in a world that doesn't really like that. Now, are you ready for this? And she needed the gospel. Hey, listen, we talk a lot about people who need the gospel and we talk about drug addiction and we talk a lot about people who need the gospel and we talk about abortions. We talk about people who need the gospel and we talk about those who are drunk and those who are addicted to alcohol. We talk about needing the gospel and we talk about those who are abusive. And we talk about those who need the gospel and their lives are in disarray. But I need you to hear this. Some, somebody in this room needs this one too. Just because you have it all together doesn't mean that you don't need the gospel. Just because your life is put together and you have wealth and you have a house and you're, you're okay. It was interesting when we planted the church here, when we moved our church here to this physical building, I was talking to another pastor friend of mine and he said, I am so glad that you're willing to take that type of church out into Pendleton. I said, you're, 
You're excited that we're taking that type of church out into Pendleton? And he said, yeah. He said, most of the time when people look at moving their churches, he said, they want to put their church right in the heart of, of uh, big community. They want to find as many people around as they can. And most of the time, churches, when they're focused on their mission, the community they want to reach is, tell me this isn't true, the, the thought of the church tends to be to reach to the inner city. Like, we want to reach to the inner city. We want, that's where the reach always seems to be. And here's what he said. It's, this, is, this was not me speaking. This was a, a friend of mine. This is what he said. He said, it's almost like people seem to think if you've got a farm and you've got a house and you've got property and a tractor that you've got your life put together. Friends, just because you've got wealth and just because you've got land and just because you have stuff, just because your life doesn't seem to look like, it, you could look around and you don't seem to, to need a savior in the sense of like, I, my life's not in disarray. I don't need Jesus to like put all the broken pieces back together in that way. That doesn't exclude you from needing the savior. There was a, my, my former pastor told the story, the pastor that I served under for about seven years, he told the story. He said there was a young preacher boy in Texas and he, would, he wanted to go and he wanted to talk to the people in the town about Jesus and he was going around knocking on doors and asking people about Jesus, asking them if they knew Jesus. He was knocking on doors, knocking on doors and there was this really big mansion. He wanted to go to this mansion and he's new to town and he's asking people who lives in the mansion and everybody says, oh, that's the, the oil tycoon. That's the big oil, oil bear and he, you can't get to him. Nobody's ever gonna let you in. He said, well, I'm, I wanna go share the gospel with him. So he ends up finding some friend of his that worked for him or whatever and gets through the gate, gets through the gate of driveway and he gets up to the door and sure enough, he just knocks on the door. He asks for the owner of the house, the, the oil tycoon and the oil tycoon comes down and is very annoyed that this preacher boy is there to talk with him and he just asked him straight he said do you know Jesus he said if you don't know Jesus you don't have eternal life he tried to tell him how much he needed Jesus and that oil tycoon was all annoyed and staring at him he said you know what he said come with me he takes the young preacher boy up onto his roof and he says look out that way what do you see and he said well I see a bunch of oil rigs he said as far as your eye can see he said there's about nine miles worth of oil rigs and I own every one of them he said every day they're pumping out millions of dollars that come right here to me I own every one of them he said look over that way what do you see he said well it looks like a town in the distance he said I own that town all those mortgages that get paid all the rent that gets paid it all comes here I own the entire town he said look over there what do you see young man and he said, well, it looks like a mountain range, a beautiful mountain range. And he said, I own all the way to the other side. I own those mountains. Those are my mountains. I own the mountains. I own this mansion. I own the rigs. I own the town. I own everything. What do I need from your Christ, from your Jesus? And without missing a beat, that preacher boy said, well, you pointed that way and that way and that way, but the one way you didn't point was that way. Listen, every one of us needs Christ. Every one of you needs Christ. Nobody gets out of that. And just because your life's put together, and by the way, for those of you who know other people and that you're, you're supposed to be talking with them about Jesus, just because somebody has their life put together doesn't mean that they know Christ, that it's all, all right. You can have everything else together, but if you miss this one thing, you've missed it all. Because if you don't have Christ, then you don't have eternal life. One last thing happens. I love this last part of the story in verse 15. And when she and her, house, and she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to stay, come to my house to stay. And so she persuaded us. I think she was probably good at that. She sold luxurious things. She convinced Paul and the apostles to stay with her and her family. And it says here that she led her entire family. Now this is a woman in a, in a predominantly male world, she just led her whole family to the Lord and her whole family, because of what she did, her whole family got baptized and her whole family got saved. You hear this last thing? Remember I told you today, we're looking at some basic things. If you want your family right, if you've been looking and saying, what's wrong in my house? How do I get this right? I'm telling you, it starts with you getting right with the Lord. Amen. You never know if you'll be the one to get right with the Lord if you'll lead your whole family to him. When I was a little boy, we were part of a church. And the church, uh, my dad liked the church. I say little, like I was four or five. My dad liked the church. The church didn't like the pastor. They grew to not like the pastor. They had no grounds to fire him, but they didn't like him. So they played a little game called Starve the Pastor. And they all decided to hold their tithe back until the pastor would leave. And then once the pastor would leave, then they would all start giving to the church again. Made my dad so mad. My dad said he would never go back to that, uh, to that church or any church ever again. And for a long time, he didn't. 
I didn't go to church from the time I was five, six years old, whatever it was, until I was about 13. 13 years old, I stood outside of a bus stop trying to tell some boy about Jesus. I believed in Jesus, totally followed him, had no question about Jesus, who Jesus was. I, I believed in Christ as my savior. I knew he's the son of God who died for me and rose for me. I believed in him. I'm trying to tell this boy about Jesus one day and he looked at me and he said, have you even been baptized? I was like, yeah, I've been ba baptized when I was a baby. I didn't know anything. I, was, I didn't have any theology. I didn't have any doctrine. I was like, yeah, I've been baptized. I was baptized when I was a baby. My brother's like, no, you aren't, you idiot. We're Baptists. We don't baptize babies. Like, yeah, we did. They probably like sprinkled me in the face or something. He's like, nope. I go home that day, like busted the door. I'm like, mom, have I been baptized? She was like, no, you idiot. We're not, we're not Catholic. We're, we're Baptists. Like you didn't, get, you didn't get baptized when you were a baby. I'm like, well, how did I, I supposed to know? So I'm like, in that moment, like, mom, I need to be baptized. I want to be baptized. And she says, you know how your dad thinks. He's not gonna, he's not gonna be happy with that. I'll skip some of that story and just tell you that I boldly had to go ask my dad if we could go to church. And at first he said no, but then later that day he said yes. And he said, where would you like to go? Here's the funny part of the story. I said, well, a friend of mine, invite, a friend of mine invited me to a little church and it's a little brick church that sits in a Y in the road. That was when I was 13, by the way. No connection to what happened in the past few years. I went out to that same church that we were from when I was 13 years old. I stood in the, the balcony of that church and at the end of the service, the service ended, I looked at my mom, I was like, when do I get baptized? And she was like, you were supposed to go forward when they told everybody to come up. And I was like, I didn't know, nobody told me. They, they called it the invitation. I didn't know, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking, like, I didn't know what that meant. She said, yeah, you, we'll come next week. My whole family went. And that Sunday I went forward. My two brothers and my brother's girlfriend went with me. Three weeks later, we were all baptized on the same day in that building, by the way. One year later, my dad started teaching a Sunday school class. And to this day, my dad is a deacon at his church, the same man who said that he would never go to church again. Now he's a deacon at his church. Are you, trying to, are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? You don't know if you'll be the one to lead your family right to Christ. If you want your family right, it better start with you getting right with the Lord. And the only way to do that, have you heard the theme all day? Whether you're wealthy, whether, whether it's the people you were thinking it was supposed to be or not, whether it's the people who are religious and praying, it doesn't matter who you are. You need Christ. He is the Savior. I want everybody to stand up on your feet, and here's my question for you. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you, I'm asking you, you're out in this audience today, do you need to make that decision that I didn't know to make when I was 13 years old, I didn't know how to do it? Do you need to come forward today and profess Christ as your Savior? Do you need to be baptized? Make it right today with God. Don't wait another day. I love the fact that Paul, when he got to these ladies, he didn't go, ah, they're not a dude from Macedonia, it's a, it's a bunch of ladies. Nope. Right then and there, he shared the gospel because that's who God wanted him sharing the gospel with. And here was a woman who got saved and her whole house got saved. What would happen today if you'd come forward and you'd make a profession for Christ? How about I get the band to come up here and I'm gonna take us all now to the, his throne in prayer. Let's go there. Heavenly Father, we are indebted to you. How grateful we are to know that even though we don't deserve you and we don't deserve a thing, that Father, you have given us your son, Jesus. And that if we believe in him, no works, faith and faith alone, that you'll save us. Thank you, Father, that you save us and you hold us. For some of us in this room today, those of us who tried to run from you, you keep drawing us back. Thank you, God. You are gracious and you're good. Father, I pray for anybody who's here today right now who needs to make a decision for you. Would you please bring them? Father, show it to them that you're our good father and you want a relationship with them. Father, let today be the day of salvation. Bring your will. Do what, Father, do what you do best. Save us. Pull them out of the miry clay. Show them that you're the answer, that your son has always been the answer and he's always been right there. May this time be blessed by you, Father. Do with it your will, whatever you want. We submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.